to Raconteurs News. Good evening and welcome to Raconteurs News. It's Tuesday evening, it's 8 o'clock and uh, it's the middle of the British summer and the uh, heat waves going on pretty much as expected. It fizzled out after about three days and now it's cold and grey and uh, although we should be out there with shorts and t-shirts on, I'm sat here with a hoodie on. Good evening, Jason. How are you? Hi, oh, hello, Andy. Uh, I'm very, very good. Very well, actually. Um, it's uh, it's my last show before we go on holiday, so I've brought in games with me tonight. Oh, excellent! And we, what with it being the last show, I've got I've got Operation, the Mad Doctor's game. I've got Kaplunk. Um, I've got Buckaroo. I've got all them things. So we'll, we'll be doing that a little bit later on. But I think we've got a fantastic guest lined up for uh, the last show uh, before our sabbatical. That's it. It's uh, one of our most popular previous guests, and uh, it's a man who's so prodigious with his output, I can't even keep up reading it. So, welcome back to Raconteurs News, John Rappaport. Good evening, John. Good evening, Andy. Good to be here. Well, I've I've been uh, following everything you've been talking about just lately, and... um, or what you've been writing about, and the one thing that has been ringing alarm bells in my head is, is particularly in the post-Brexit era, we seem to be having a massive um, upscaling of the, um, air quotes, terrorist instance we're seeing. It, it's, it's something every day now, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I would say that's a very apt connection that you're making there to Brexit because one of the prime motives behind uh, violence and terrorism and uh, so on fake or real is well we've got to clamp down now we can't just let this all go on Uh, we have to do something about this and so inevitably that means uh, less freedom less power for the individual and uh, they drag out all the old slogans, we're all in this together, and we have to have more unity and caring and love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what this really means uh, for the power elites is this is when they decide to lower the boom, mm-hmm. make new laws, new regulations, uh, bring in more law enforcement uh, in, the, in the wake of these events to say, well, we're going to keep you safe, but you're going to have to trade away some of your freedom in order to remain safe. And we know that you want to do this, of course, and so we're just carrying out your wishes. And that's always the program. And in America, for example, and I think in many other places around the world as well, we see a tremendous militarization of police forces. So now they look, they act, they work as armies. They're not just police anymore. Do you think that that's, um, do you think that that is due to the, um, some people in America still being um, concerned about passi commentardis? I think that's what it's called, isn't it? Where there's there's no military allowed on the streets to in 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 domestic situations. Oh yeah, <clears throat> very much so. Because so so you, what you you don't need the military on the street. What you do is you dress the, the police up like the military and they do the same job. Exactly, and not only that, two things. One is you give the police the most advanced weapon systems that you could possibly imagine. And I've seen footage on this. We're talking about rows and rows of uh, armored vehicles. That They are military vehicles. And they are being given to community police forces across America. And I'm not just talking about uh, big city police forces. Small communities are getting this kind of uh, armament, as well as very powerful weapons and, of course, all kinds of body armor and shields and so forth. But it is militarizing the police because posse comitatus is a serious uh, rule of law in America. If you start seeing the army all over the place all the time, that would lead to some serious 
resistance and revolt. So you do it with the police. And the other thing is, of course, if you build up and heavily publicize the number of incidents where purportedly uh, police are shooting innocent victims in America, then the Department of Justice, the federal agency, and the White House and so forth come in behind this and they say, well, we have to impose certain national standards on police forces all over America, which means we, the feds, have to meddle we have to get in there, we have to reorganize things, we have to take control, and this means the federalization of police in America, so that you no longer have autonomous individual police departments all over America, they are now all connected at the federal level, and that would mean ultimately, and that's what we're heading toward here in America, as a national police force a unified single police force which again what's the difference between that and an army there really isn't any difference no. so that's where all of this is going and uh it's a very threatening element i know the same thing is happening in the uk mm. on many levels surveillance is another issue where you now have police forces not the federal government only but the police forces have tremendously advanced surveillance capabilities now, 24-7, to be able to spy on everybody all the time. I've also seen footage of this, uh, control rooms, you know, where you've got all the video monitors and all the information feeds coming in and so forth. And you would say, well, this must be the National Security Agency. No, no. It's a, a police force where you're seeing all this happening. So the surveillance state is being established in America, not only on a federal level, but on local levels as well. So you have overlapping surveillance of all kinds. And that means that, you know, people are being spied on all the time. So John, John, are people... I, I, sorry, but we, uh, we over here in the UK, we're, we're completely sort of protected from uh, protected but wrapped in cotton wool as it were but what 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 are people like in in america are they aware of uh passi and, and are they aware of what is what the police seem to be doing in the military uh, sorry the militar milita militarization militarization yeah and uh, <laughs> and of course um uh, the militarization and of course the the, the 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 federal aspect of it they you know they're, they're becoming more and more federal do, do, are people aware of that and are people wary of that and is that why um we're seeing communities divided so that that sort of takes away from 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 what 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 the government are doing because i know there's been a lot of stuff like black lives matter um campaigns and stuff like that and, and they always just seem to cause division. Yeah, absolutely. Um, more people are aware of what you're talking about. They are waking up, but still, the large majority of people, I would say, in America are not aware. Or if they are, they're intentionally looking the other way. Because... Trading freedom for security is still a powerful message for most people because most people, their lives are circumscribed by what they do. You know, they live at home, they go to work, mm -hmm. they have neighbors on their street, etc. They take vacations, it's, they, you know, that's it. So they're aware of the violence. And when the government comes in and says, okay, we're going to do more now, still most people welcome that. That's what they want. And you can understand that because incidents where violence is occurring and the violent protests, for example, of Black Lives Matter and so forth, all of that is leading to more fear. That's the objective, is to bring more fear to more people who then go to the government and say protect us yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, it's the it's the usual thing it's um 
it, it um, it's the Hegelian dialectic in it. It's a problem reaction solution. Um, yeah. and, and once people are in a state of fear, then they don't think critically anymore. They think on a, on, on basically a fight or flight um, reaction. And uh, usually it's flight and let the government take over. Yes, exactly. And uh, you correctly bring up fear because, you know, problem, reaction, solution. Yes, that is the model. Or you could call it the dialectic model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for most people, what that really boils down to is, am I afraid? And if so, what am I afraid of? And if uh, whatever that is... Can I get the people in authority to take away that fear? Mm -hmm. Either re really take it away or pretend to take it away. In a, in a sense, it doesn't matter as long as people believe that their fear can be removed. So that's the, that's the basic formula. And, you know, there's another thing here which is operating, and uh, I've written about this recently. The BLM protests and the street protests in America about police violence and so forth, that has been framed as pointing the finger at what is really troubling all the poverty-stricken inner cities in America. That's now the picture of what's wrong with the inner cities or the ghettos of America, right? Mm -hmm. This is completely preposterous and absurd. What's wrong is generation to generation poverty that's gotten worse because jobs have been taken away and sent overseas as part of the globalist program. You've got gangs who are violent by nature right destructive of life essentially holding the residents of inner cities in hostage for decades massive drugs problems crime etc etc these are the things that are destroying and have been destroying inner cities but the federal government has no intention of solving those problems in fact, they want a permanent underclass that is completely dependent on the government, and that creates this kind of vortex that goes wider and draws more and more people in to a life of poverty, dependence, and so forth that drags the whole country down, which is the objective, which is the primary objective here. And these are the problems, the real problems, will never be solved or even looked at seriously. And so since 1966 in America, when President Lyndon Johnson declared the so-called war on poverty, roughly it's estimated $2 trillion have been spent on trying to wipe out poverty, and much of that money has gone to inner cities. And it's a total failure. Things are much worse now than they were in 1966. Mm -hmm. So now you've got the question on top of this of corruption which I pointed out many times, where did all that money actually go? Two trillion dollars. Uh, who got the money? Who stole yep. the money? Where did they put it? What did they end up using it for? All of these kinds of things, which are completely uninvestigated and are buried secrets because nobody really knows. Nobody has bothered least of all the federal government, to admit, hey, this program is a gigantic failure and we have to investigate the crimes of corruption that made it fail. Never going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then I've got to add one more piece in here because it's maybe the strongest, and that is in inner cities, I don't care where it is in the world, you've got people, heroic people here and there who have created successful local businesses and enterprises regardless of circumstances these are the real heroes these are the real leaders these are the real uh, smart people and 
<clears throat> they should be teaching on a regular basis with a tiny fraction of the money that's been spent on the war on poverty, teaching their neighbors how to do it. How do you start a business? How do you run a business? How do you make it survive in this atmosphere? I am a guy who's done it. Therefore, let me show you how. On a, Not just on a weekend or an evening, but I mean on a regular basis, right? We've got people in several cities across America, for example, Chicago, who have started... Uh, what are called urban farms. Mm -hmm. There's one in Chicago that's indoors in a huge building where the local residents are taught to grow nutritious, fresh, clean food that they then eat, which solves, you know, the, the hunger problem to a, a significant extent, also improves community relations, <coughs> shows people that with good hard work, they can ra uh, raise themselves up from where they were before. The federal government could take a look at a few of these programs and say, okay, here's what we're going to do, and nothing is going to stop this. We're going to create 10,000 urban farms in inner cities across America. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it by finding the people there who have already succeeded and paying them to show other people how to do it on their own. Because we, the feds, of course, know nothing about this. We have no experience. All we have are bureaucrats and idiots. So we're going to give the money to the people who can do it. And within five or six years, you could have several thousand of these urban farms flourishing in inner cities in America or anywhere in the world, and you would have that alone as a revolution and transforming life in those places. Never going to happen. Not on the agenda. No, neither, no. We, neither we, is successful business of any kind in inner cities on the agenda. The governments, the governments and, and people around the world seem to have created this victim culture where nobody wants to be proactive and do anything because they feel that they're a victim. Um, whether it's um, Black Lives Matter or whether it's um, somebody who's who doesn't agree with immigrants coming in it, again it's always a victim culture so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying what we're trying to do is we're trying to portray ourselves as a bigger victim than somebody else who thinks they're a victim do, do you understand what i mean oh yeah I, i'm i'm all over this uh, i agree with you completely that's the whole idea here see mm -hmm. uh it's like are you a victim could you become a victim let us show you how Yes. That's the program, <laughs> you know, that's the program. And if, if you qualify as a victim, then there are all kinds of freebies that are available to you, which means you will become a permanent member of the underclass dependent on the government for the rest of your life. That's the elite view of this. Of yeah. course, you've got all these people running around screaming about, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. They don't see it that way. They don't understand that they're just pawns in this game. Mm -hmm. There have been so many warnings from history, though, John. I, kn I know um, the school system over in the States is um, in an equally poor state to what it is over here, and that's possibly why so many people are unaware of their history, but you've got so many great statement, statesmen over there in the past who have warned people about this so many times. Um, I think off the top of my head, was it Thomas Jefferson that said, uh, any man who will trade, trade some of his freedom or liberty for security will uh, deserves neither and will lose both. But Benjamin Franklin... It was. I, I apologize, Ben Franklin. No, that's quite all right. No, but that's right. And he said that, you know, at the beginning of the Republic, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't as if uh, the founders were unaware of this. They understood how it could all go downhill. But well, the founders had just got gotten rid of the entire system that uh, that, that that seems to have crept back in. Yes, exactly. The dependence on. Uh, Britain as a colony and all of that, you know, that was gotten rid of. And then it didn't just creep back in. I mean, it was put back in. And, of course, people tend to be willing 
to go for that. Oh, you mean I can get something for nothing? You mean I don't have to work for it? You mean uh, I can reduce the risk that comes with living? You mean uh, I can be protected? Wow, I want all those things. So that, that seems like a good choice to me. And then somebody taps him on the shoulder and says, wait a minute. Yeah. Don't you remember that this whole thing was set up in the opposite direction? That the whole idea was you have freedom, therefore you have power. Therefore, you can make your own life, you can make your own future. That was the whole idea. What happened to that? Well, that was a good idea, too, but this is more attractive. See? Mm-hmm. Because, hey, I don't have to do so much. I don't, get, I don't have to... F- go ahead. And I don't I have get to think lo- so much. I get loads of time to chase down Pokemons. <laughs> yeah. I can chase Pokemons for the rest of my life and enjoy that. And that's where we're going, believe me. I've seen uh, a few examples here. People, you know, for a long time have been warning about how a new money system is going to be installed and so forth and so on. It's going to be a cashless society and whatever. Well, that's been happening forever, ever since the credit cards came in. I mean, that's a cashless society, you know. It's plastic. It's digital. Everybody's got it a card, you know, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people. And then on top of this, there are now murmurings of, you know, maybe we should give everybody a monthly income. Mm, Yeah, this has been touted a lot across Europe. I think uh, Switzerland has just, um, just started doing that. Well, they voted it down. Oh, did they vote it down? Yeah, but it was proposed, seriously. I mean, it got to that level in a country like Switzerland where you would never expect it to. It did raise its ugly head, and it's going to happen in a lot of other places. Uh, Places, uh, you know, Canada would be a good uh, candidate for that sort of thing. Well, you know, this would be an extremely humane idea, and if we just give everybody a certain amount of money every month and then other people would say well what about the people who are already making good living okay so we'll need to make some adjustments there and then you've got bureaucrats that are hired to do that and regulations and this and that and systems are developed that is where we are heading and one of the reasons behind this all is that when you look at the mega corporations that manufacture products for sale, for a long time now, these corporations have been operating their assembly lines on less than maximum overdrive. Half capacity, uh-huh. two thirds capacity. Because in this world, maybe, I'm going to just throw out a figure, let's say that there are maybe 1.5 billion people who can really participate in the, quote, global economy, the consumerist economy. Everybody else is below that line. So these corporations are beginning to wake up to the fact that the trend is really heading toward diminished profits for them at the same time that they're developing technology that would allow them to create many, many more of whatever they're selling. So this idea of, okay, so let's give everybody in the world a minimum monthly income. From the corporation's point of view, they're rubbing their hands and saying, yeah, this is a very good idea because they're looking at these people now as potential consumers. Now we can sell them more crap that will be unhealthy and useless and so forth. And uh, this is where all that is going. <clears throat> and the model is the inner cities, where you have, again, a permanent underclass of people on welfare, government benefits, that are able to eke out survival and get certain free things like free cell phones, etc. And, you know, expand that model, make it bigger, make it wider, deeper. That's where things are going. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you see, that's something I'd not thought about before. I mean, that is ideal for the corporations because uh, the being that if, if everybody gets a sort of basic income, um, uh, what they're going to spend it on, <laughs> you know, what they're going to spend it on, they're going to spend yeah. it on, on consumer goods. <laughs> so essentially, that's the corporations doing um, just just stealing public money. Exactly. Um, exactly what's happening. There is a bit of a counter argument to that, which um, I've heard quite a lot, John. And Lady Fortish brings it up in the chat room tonight, and she's saying, uh, "John, wouldn't a basic living income given by the state free up artists and innovators to do what they do best?" Yes, I understand that argument. I do. However, I would say that on balance. What's really going to happen is that most of the people who participate in such a program are not going to be the artists. They're not going to be the creative people. They are going to be the people who are trained to become the consumerists because that's what they want to be. So, yes, there is that other offset, but it isn't a balanced offset by any stretch of the imagination not at all i suppose in reality most artists and innovators do what they do because they're driven by their internal passion to do it and whether they've got a pot to piss in or not really doesn't figure in their way of thinking uh i would agree they're going to do it they can't be stopped from doing it and it's it's history history proves that to be the case so that's also part of this equation. That, it, I was just going to say, yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that it's not done on uh, by accident. If it's done, it'll be done on purpose. Um, I just wanted to move on. I just wanted to um, get your take on what you feel about the um, the circus that is the presidential campaign in the United States at the moment. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, at one point, it became obvious to me that this was a certain version of divide and conquer because you had two people on the edges, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump. And amazingly, they became extremely popular. Normally, people who would be espousing what they have been espousing would be so marginalized that they would only be you know in the campaign just to make a show make a face get a few delegates drop out and all of a sudden they are the story Hillary Clinton for much of the campaign has been hiding out building up her war chest getting her ducks in a row making deals wherever she can make deals, you know, to win. And here you had Trump and Sanders, right? And they're saying, A, they hate each other. Don't even want to be in the same room with this guy, right? Two, they're saying almost exactly the same thing about globalism. Mm -hmm. They both hate the trade treaties. They both hate the fact that manufacturing jobs have been taken out of America and sent into third world hell holes where these corporations pay slave wages and then export the products back into America and other places with no tariffs, no penalties, no nothing, and drive other businesses in those countries out of business, which has been happening. In fact... Bernie Sanders wrote a uh, piece for the New York Times about uh, a month and a half ago where he uh, cited this figure. In the last 15 years in America, 60,000 factories have closed. 60,000. Well, this is all because those corporations and companies either took the jobs out of America or... By doing that, they can now sell those products back here very cheap, and the companies here that were making those products were driven out of business, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
and the solution, uh, although they they claim Sanders and Trump that they don't have the same solution, it's really the same solution. You have to bring the the companies back to America with penalties. Okay, you got you want to go to the end of the earth to make uh, sneakers and running shoes. All right, if you want to sell those in America, you're going to pay a penalty a tariff that is going to put you on an even playing field with the companies that make running shoes in America. Yep. So here you have divide and conquer. The issue of globalism and these horrendous trade treaties which are destroying economies are being represented by two men who appear to be polar opposites in their ideology and are splitting the voters in America who perceive that globalism is a fantastically horrendous problem and while that is going on Hillary Clinton in her souped up Cadillac drives right up the middle between those two hoping to steal the election yep And she is the foremost candidate for globalism, for the trade treaties, for destroying economies, for putting people out of work, for all of that. And nobody is pointing this out, so I keep pointing it out. In fact, partly as a joke, I said the ideal ticket to win this election would be Trump and Bernie on the same ticket. Then they would win. Then they could argue with themselves till hell freezes over and scream at each other in the White House. Who cares? But finally, there might be an opportunity to reverse this uh, vortex that is sucking everybody in called globalism. But, you know, we don't have that. And Neither one of these guys, Trump or Sanders, is willing to acknowledge the other and play nice and say, look, you know, Trump would say socialism is the worst friggin' idea I've ever heard of, Bernie. But what you're saying about globalism is right on. And Bernie would say, you know, you're a selfish narcissist, lunatic, Donald, who doesn't uh, care about anybody else but yourself, but... What you're saying about globalism is exactly on the money. And no matter who wins this election, we have to make sure that the American people understand what has been happening to them. So this this seems like a a really genius trick on behalf of um, Hillary and the globalists and the cabal, uh, because what they've done is they've put uh, opposition in front of people which, um, if, like you say, if they were together, they would probably win, whereas it splits that opposition to globalisation um, completely out of the water, and then, like you say, she can go down the middle. It's, it's, it's genius. It is. It is genius. And people have not recognised it. So I keep pointing it out. Mm-hmm. This is called divide and conquer, folks. <clears throat> and the biggest worst uh, political and economic movement on this planet for at least the last hundred years has been globalism. You have to understand that. Mm -hmm. And here they're presenting it to you, right? Showing it to you, but from two different angles, splitting, dividing and conquer people who are not smart enough to see through the fog. And therefore, it's highly likely that the next president is going to be one of the strongest globalists that's ever been put in the White House. I I see that it's been unfolding for a while, and that seems to be the obvious thing that's going to happen there. Um, We have got... uh, Lady Forty has asked another question, which I think many people worldwide are asking about Hillary, uh, particularly in light of the the recent um, uh, congressional hearings with uh, the head of the FBI. There, 
why the hell isn't she in prison? Yeah. Well, I wrote extensively about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fix was in from the beginning yeah. because it had to be because she did commit crimes and there was no question about it. And some people say, well, it's not that serious. Oh, you know, okay, whatever you want to say about it. But if you want to go by the book, these are felonies. She could get up to 10 years in prison for gross negligence in the handling of classified material. And when the uh, head of the FBI got up there and testified, or when he made his recommendation about what should be done, he spelled out her crimes specifically. Mm -hmm. This, that, concealed this, didn't turn over that, bop, bop, bop. <clears throat> and then he said, but there was no intent that we found to actually commit a crime. Therefore, I am recommending no prosecution. Well, if you go back to the actual law, federal law, which I quoted in two articles, that is a crime. Intent doesn't matter. That section of the law was written specifically to cover what's called gross negligence in order to eliminate the argument about intent, which is always difficult to read mm. in many cases. Did the person actually intend to commit a crime and we're going to argue that? No. This part of the law says it doesn't matter. So Comey, the head of the FBI suddenly assumed many roles. First of all, in having a global press conference where he recommended to his boss, uh, the Attorney General, the highest law enforcement person in the land, that there be no prosecution, that's unheard of. The FBI director doesn't get on global television and say, we are not recommending prosecution. No. What they do is they take all their evidence, they summarize it, they pass it along to the attorney general, and she or he decides what to do. Prosecute, not prosecute. That's the way that works. So he was basically acting as attorney general at that moment. And in fact, the attorney general, who had met with Bill Clinton two days before at a Phoenix airport and had a secret conversation... That was fortunate for her because, look, she could say, well, I'm sorry, I now see that that could be perceived as a conflict of interest, so I'm basically recusing myself and I will do whatever the FBI recommends. So in a, in a moment, she's abdicating her job as Attorney General and passing that job over to the head of the FBI. Right? Then on top of that, there was no, no grand jury, okay? No grand jury, which is normal in federal cases where you have a prosecutor in front of a group of citizens trying to make a case to prosecute, say, Hillary in this case or not, whatever. That didn't happen. So Comey was also the grand jury. And then he was also an appellate judge because these judges interpret the meaning of the law. And in this case... He was interpreting the meaning of the law incorrectly to say that intent didn't matter or intent actually mattered when it doesn't, when gross negligence is enough. Yeah, it's strict liability, they call it in this country. So yeah. uh, it doesn't matter what your intent was. If, 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 the, if the actus reus has, been, um, has happened, in, in this case... The act is these emails have been leaked. Uh, it doesn't matter what the mens rea is, the, the, the intent, um, it's because it's strict liability. Exactly. So she ends up not being prosecuted when, you know, everybody with half a brain knows that she should have been prosecuted. And if that had happened, <clears throat> then either she would have had to drop out of the race for president or she would have had to spend the entire campaign answering questions or ducking questions about her guilt, 
which probably would have led to her losing the election because uh, certainly the Republicans would have made a tremendous amount of hay out of this. But, but do you sure. want to, do you want to elect a president who's under prosecution but, at this sure. very moment? You know that kind of stuff, right? Surely, if we had a media, a proper, real, proper media, they would be asking these questions anyway, and and so yeah. she would be a, 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 a dead duck in the water. And the fact that she hasn't, I mean, in this country we've got um, we've got a, a leader who's completely being bes- it's, it's the complete opposite of Hillary. It's Jeremy Corbyn is the leader of the Labour Party, and he's got a huge mandate from the the um, the people. Um, the, the members of the Labour Party, and he was elected last year with a, a, a huge, massive majority. And since uh, Brexit has happened, there's been a sort of backbench coup um, of people, and there's been all these stories coming out about him that all turn out not to be true, um, and, and all they're doing is they're trying to slur him um, just to get rid of him, because the, 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 um, the, the front bench MPs that wanted to get rid of him are all... You know, in the club, as it were, common purpose. The, the, the you know, the basically Tories it, it, with red rosettes on, and so they're doing exactly the opposite. If we had a decent media, surely the questions that you're talking about, the media should be asking anyway. Yeah, and not only asking, <clears throat> but pounding on day after day after day. After Just like day. they're doing with Corbyn, right? Because you know, on the one hand. People like to say, well, the media will print anything if it's a hot enough story because they want to sell newspapers and they want to sell advertising, etc., etc., etc. Well, certain times that's true. But then there are other times when they won't do that no matter what. And this is one of those times because believe me, having been around the news business for 35 years now, this Hillary story was hot as a stick of dynamite. And if the media had persisted and pounded on it and played up all the angles and started interviewing uh, all sorts of politicians and In kept the story stupid. alive, by now, fires would be burning on the front page of every newspaper in America because this would continue to be the hottest story there is. And in the same way, uh, you know, from afar, I can see that as soon as the Brexit vote uh, was cast, then all of a sudden, stories began appearing, not only in the UK, but here, of course, too. There are so many dire consequences that are immediately going to be inflamed by this vote that the UK is going down the toilet for what they did, right? And then the stock market, you know, oh my God, it's gone down, 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 down. A week later, hey, it's a new high. Great, terrific, right? (laughs) And all of these, you know, baloney stories are just hanging there in midair. You know, a country, uh, a place like Britain is not going to go under because it withdraws from the EU, There could be other reasons, but that doesn't happen to be one of them. You know, as long as there are people in England who want to buy products that are manufactured in other countries, and as long as British uh, companies are manufacturing goods that other countries want to buy, there's going to be trade, okay? They're going to work it out. It's not a big deal. It's not difficult to do. So the media will play up stories that are totally untrue, just because that's their job. That's, that's where they live. They're partners in globalism. Okay, that's, you know, the EU is globalism. Brexit is anti-globalism. Brexit is a, uh, you know, a trumpet sounding. Hey, some things that we thought were impossible are actually possible. We can leave. And if we can leave, other people can leave, too. And that is another story. I mean, if I were publishing a big newspaper, that story would be on page one every day. What about Italy? What about Greece? What's happening in other countries? You know, 
how have these trade treaties destroyed the economy in other countries? In the U.S., when Bill Clinton signed NAFTA, another one of these treaties, in 1994, that immediately allowed the U.S. to export very cheap corn to Mexico. Well, there are huge numbers of corn farmers in Mexico that are suddenly in deep trouble. 1.5 million Mexican corn farmers driven into bankruptcy by NAFTA. Do you think some of those farmers decided to come up across the border because they couldn't make a living anymore and they were broke and their land was worthless? They couldn't find another way to, to make things work? You know, a story like that still has legs. Mm. 20 years later, the media could be doing all kinds of stuff that they're not doing. We're trying our best, aren't we, uh, Andy? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously... We've not got a very big audience, but, you know, um, it, some of them are quite big. It's very difficult to scratch the surface of what they're doing without the incredible amounts of money they've got behind them. Um, so... <laughs> All the support that we get is highly valued and I'd like to thank all the people that have donated to us and helped us to carry on doing what we're doing and hopefully improve things as we go along. i, t I tell you what they do do, though, uh, John, what they do do very well is they cover all the bases, don't they? I mean, you get the geopolitics and then you get the um, the, the national politics, then you get local politics and then you get these, the psychology of it all. Then you get all the false flag stuff that they put in. They put a lot of work into this, which is probably why sometimes they, they have to cut corners and they, they leave us clues like in these recent um, these recent um, supposed terror attacks. Well, sure, they're not perfect and they've never been perfect. They've screwed up royally on many occasions. And that's why they need the media, you know, to cover, to cover what's happening. And even in the media, stories leak out. But what happens when a story leaks out, for example, uh, and, I, and I predicted this uh, two, three months ago, the Washington Post, one of the, you know, four or five biggest newspapers in America, ran a big article saying, Medical errors are now the third leading cause of death in America behind heart disease and cancer. Medical errors, third leading cause of death in America. Okay, So they lied when they said errors because I've analyzed this thing very specifically in the past. It's not the errors, you know, it's the drugs, it's the uh, mistreatment in hospitals and so on, whatever. But, okay. The medical system, they're basically saying, is the third leading cause of death in America, which is a, an incredible thing to say because the medical system is supposed to be saving lives, right? I mean, it's not like saying automobile accidents are the third leading cause of death. It's saying the one profession dedicated to saving lives is the third leading cause of death in America. Hey, I suppose so I said when I covered this, saying, I said... Um, I said, here's what's going to happen, folks. This story is going to disappear. It's going to be as if it never happened. There's going to be no follow-up. No other major media outlets are going to cover this. There's going to be no investigation of exactly what this means and why it's so. These newspapers and uh, television networks are not going to follow up and say, wow, this is gigantic. We're now going to send out the hounds and we're going to find out what the medical people are doing to destroy life in America at this rate. No, none of that is going to happen. And true enough, the story is gone now as if it was never published. The media covered its own ass. Okay, this story, we, we put it out there, but we're never going to cover it again. It'll be as if it never happened. And and I think the, I think they are, of the whole lot of them. I know we've got the, the people at the very top that are controlling everything, but of the whole lot of them, I think the most guilty are the media because they could put an end to this immediately. They are the ones that could put an end to this, just like that. 
Exactly. In a heartbeat. If they would do it. And here's something else. The big newspapers in America are dying. They're dying. The New York Times had to refinance that they originally took on. It's like refinancing the debt of the debt just to stay alive. So if they would start to cover these kinds of stories and pound on them day in and day out and change everything in a heartbeat, like you said, they could be printing two editions a day and selling them on the street like hotcakes because, as it turns out, people are very interested in these stories when they appear and when they continue to appear. So suddenly these newspapers could make gigantic profits instead of losses. And still, that's not enough to convince them to do it because they're part of the club. They're, par they're partners with the elites who are doing all this in the first place. So come hell or high water, they are not permitted to do that kind of thing that could actually make them profitable once again. And, of course, uh, we're also under attack. We, they've got all those bases covered, but we're also under attack because um, the one thing I would imagine um, that a lot of the um, officers in World War One would have liked to have been able to do on the day of the Somme is to go in and, and put some poison in the enemy's cups of teas, the morning teas. And that's really what they're doing to us. Is we're the that we're seen as the enemy, and we're being attacked on uh, on so many psychological um, and financial ways, but also with the, with things like vaccines as well. Um, there are also vaccines, fluorid, fluoridation of the water. Um, we're also being attacked on that front as well. Yes, but here I want to say to me the most important thing, and that is. <clears throat> A person could take what we're talking about here and say, now I've got my reason to become a victim. Hey, listen to what these guys are saying. I've got a perfect storyline now for myself to become a victim. Nothing works. Nothing can be done. There's no way out of this. It's all doom all the time. So now I'm a victim bullshit yep. you're not a victim unless you decide to be and the power that every individual inherently has to do something to create imagine invent something that is going to wake more people up and change the course of the river where it's flowing is the issue of our time and so I spend at least as much time providing information that I believe will empower the individual as I do pointing out what is being done to the individual because people should not get the wrong idea this is not information to use to become helpless because if you do that it defeats the whole purpose. Waking up is supposed to be a prelude to taking action. Using your mind, your imagination, your creative power. Discovering how much power you actually have. Taking a risk, crossing the line between passiveness and active action. That's the lesson of all of this. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. Um, yeah, it's all about um, empowering yourself. It's all about not being becoming a victim because that that is it, at the at the end of the day that is what they want. Sorry, I, I hate saying it at the end of the day, and I've just said it again. But but that is what they want. They want people to feel like the victims, uh, and one, one, once people feel like the victims, they, they can be controlled. They can be manipulated. It's it's really easy. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I completely agree with you, John. What, what would you suggest um, the one or a few th different things that people can do to, to you know, just 
to make their own lives uh, uh, that little bit better and to help them understand how things are going on, how things uh, how things work. Well, something as ridiculously simple as this. Every day you write down what an answer to this question. What could I do <clears throat> to create the future that I want for myself and other people? What could I do? And allow your imagination to fly because that's the key, you see. Because what most people will answer when you ask that question is, well, you know, I tried this, I've heard of that, and that didn't work, and this doesn't work, and so forth. Yeah, fine. But that's not your imagination. That's just your report on what other people have thought of. Everybody has a unique imagination. And if you do that long enough, that writing exercise, so to speak, your imagination may swing into gear and you may begin to see things that you've never seen before in your entire life. And an idea will pop up and you'll go, oh my God, that's something I actually not only could do, but actually want to do it. Now you begin to feel passion. Now you begin to feel energy. Now you begin to feel inspiration. Now you begin to change. Now you begin to become more of what you actually are. Now you begin to move from a feeling of passivity into a feeling of energy, action, dynamism. If you did that every day, who knows? You might come across one of these things that pops up out of nowhere and now you grab it. And you say, that's what I'm going to do. And then your life has changed forever after that point. That is absolutely fabulous, John. And it really ties in with the email I got off you today. Um, and for anyone who's not signed up to John's uh, daily emails, I would really strongly urge them to. Um, at new, no more fake news dot com. Um, we realise that you're only able to stay with us an hour tonight. And thank you for taking that hour to spend with us, John. Have you got any, any more links or ways of contacting you that you'd like to give out so that people can uh, uh, catch up with your work, please? Well, actually, the website you just gave out, that's the best way, nomorefakenews.com. You can come there, you can read articles, uh, you can sign up for the email list so you get the articles in your email box. You can look around, you can see what else is happening there. I'm writing every day. New articles are coming up every day. So that's the, you know, I, purposely I keep it simple. You just go to nomorefakenews.com and there it is for you. So my invitation to everybody and just show up and uh, there are archives. You can go back uh, and see past articles and so forth. It's all there. That's brilliant, John. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, also, I, since the last time you were on with us, um, you've taken a regular spot with Jimmy Church on Fade to Black Radio, haven't you? That's right. Every Thursday night uh, for a half hour, uh, 7.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific time, I'm on live covering stories of the week, any issues that I want to bring up. And that has become quite popular lots of people tuning in fade to black you can find that that's the name of the show and uh so every thursday night i'm doing that well thank you so much for joining us tonight john and uh, i do hope you'll be able to come back in the future and spend a little more time with us always a popular guest and uh just love your output man thank yeah. you guys so much i really appreciate it and look forward to coming on again Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank John. You. And uh, I guess now we'll... Uh, shall we play a tune, Jason? Yeah, I think we should play a couple of tunes. Uh, it sort of solves that, you know. Um, rubbers, you know, arrange our, our, our um, crown jewels and go and get a drink and uh, perhaps put, put one of a clown's hair on and, and, and one of these noses. Like, yeah. You know, on a, a red one. My crown jewels are nicely arranged, mate. They're on a little velvet cushion just at the side of the desk here. 
So, oh, well. right. <laughs> See, my cat sits on that. <laughs> okay, we'll play a tune. Well, we, we've got a nice long one lined up for you. We've got uh, something from Roger Waters, which seemed a bit apt for talking to John. So we'll be back in about eight and a half minutes. See you then. <sighs> okay, here we go.
Tony Moran, WBF Cruiserweight World Champion, speaking on Raconteur News. Thank you for that, Tony, and welcome back to Raconteur's News. I hope you enjoyed a bit of a chill out with Roger Waters there. After the information overload um, we got with uh, John Rappaport there, um, how could I nearly forget his name? But you know what it's like when you're talking and suddenly your mind goes blank. I thought, hang on, who was that guy we'd just been talking to? <laughs> Mm. But uh, you know, some absolutely terrific information. And uh, as I said before the break, anyone who hasn't signed up to John's newsletter, I strongly urge you to do it. It's um, it, it's quite difficult to keep up with his output because he, he is prolific with his output. But um, you don't have to read every one of them. You know, I, I pick and choose which ones I read. But um, they certainly make you think, John's emails. And uh, I, I just... Today I thought, what an ideal day to get John on because I I, um, I went to my default news channel, which is usually RT because you kind of get usually a little bit more sensible level of bullshit on there than you get on the the main mainstream channels, and I saw that it was just terror attacks everywhere. And then uh, see the the headline, which really fitted in with what John was talking about the the U.S. Police Department are now t- so terrified after all these shootings of innocent cops that they've spent seven and a half million dollars on uh, military weapons, military grade weapons, so that the officers don't need to be afraid of these lone gunmen anymore. Any thoughts on that, Jason? Well, no, but I'll tell you what I do want to I, I do want to bring up um, mm. this morning. We've we've got all these terror attacks, haven't we? Going off. There's, uh, uh, I think over. I think we've had about three today, haven't we? We've had we've had that j- j- Japanese one. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, that's not necessarily a terror attack, but it it it's in it. What it does, it triggers the terror, the fear of terror in you, because you instantly think terror attack, mm. and that's what it's designed to do. The more and more they overload our subconscious with with uh, with terror attacks. Uh, the 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 more you think anything, every every time you think some, you see something on the news. First thing you think is it is it terrorist uh, is it a terrorist attack? And that's just to to get your subconscious into that state of fear. Now there would there's been I think there's been about three terror attacks today. So we've had this Japanese one, we've had this uh, we've had and we had a couple in we've had one that one in France where that vicar got his dessert throat cut. Yeah, he got his throat cut by ISIS hostage takers. The eighty-four-year-old oh, ISIS. Priest. Uh, oh, but notice how um, they call them so-called ISIS. Now they call them so-called ISIS because that's a legal statement. The, the news now that that they don't give you any news. That's a legal statement. They call it oh, so-called ISIS. So if it turns out that they're wrong, they can just. Well, it, it, it wasn't. We could, nobody can do anything. We weren't actually wrong because we said so-called ISIS because that's what everyone else were calling them. So fucking load of bollocks. Anyway, sorry. Mm. <coughs> so we've got this, this, this one in. Um, uh, we've had this one. This Afghan guy in Germany. This seventeen-year-old uh, went to. We were an Afghan um, immigrant into Germany who, who went off with his axe. Mm-hmm. Remember him? Yeah. Um, then we've had. Um, I mean, there's been countless. There's well, there's been another count- one. Another one today. There's a, a gunman fatally shot dead. A doctor at a Berlin clinic, not terrorist related. Hyphen police. So there you, there go. you go. Not terrorist related, but what's it doing? It's planting that seed in your mind. Mm. It's tr- it triggers that trauma, that collective trauma that we've all got, which all stems from September 11th. Because remember, that was the biggest terrorist attack. It was the most, it was the biggest, tra- most traumatic global event ever. That was beamed to millions and millions of people, and that is still in many people's psyche. And we get it into the kids' psyche who who weren't around to remember it. We get it into their psyche by showing them every year. Oh, this is what happened on the anniversary. This is what happened. That's all. That's for. That's all it is for, is so that people that didn't actually witness the event or weren't around 
they can they can have the trauma as well. So what that does is then every time you see a news story that's got a, involving a gun or you've got a knife or you've got something, instantly you think terrorism. So there has to be a few that don't that they say oh, it's not terrorist related, but it doesn't matter. The impact is still the same. The impact is the first thing you think is terrorists. Mm. So we've got all these terrorist attacks going on. Uh, and this uh, this morning I was driving to uh, Carlisle. And um, I, I set off quite early. Uh, and I was listening to BBC News, which is, I mean, it's just <laughs> God almighty. <coughs> I, what I do is I do listen to it. I was out in Cumbria. I was going across the A66 when I'm when I when I'm listening to uh, Five Live in the morning, and you see, I've not got a sense of smell, so I can't smell all the shit that's on the on the fields and everything. I can't smell it. So what I have to do is I have to put Five Live on, and that supplements the shit intake that I get. Right. So I just listen to Five Live instead of smelling the horse manure and the shit that's on the fields and all that. I can't smell that, so I, I, I listen to Five Live and it supplements it. So I get my daily intake of shit. I think it's five shits a day in it, something like that. Anyway, yeah, they, they call it your five a day. So, I do, so I, I'm listening to this, and then it comes to, right, the phone-in, the big phone-in issue of the day. What is it? Terrorism. How has your height impacted on your life? If you're very tall or very small, please phone in and oh. tell us how it's impacted your life, your height, how high <laughs> you are or how small you are. or Are you a tall woman? Are you a small man? Would you date a small man if you're a tall woman? Well, and you think it to yourself, oh, my God, <laughs> what are they doing? Seriously, though, what are they doing? I mean, they're, they're, they're taking money for this. We've got all this stuff going on. Well, and I suppose, it, really, when we played that uh, Roger Waters song there, Comfortably Numb, we should have dedicated that to anyone who listens to or watches any output by the BBC on a regular basis, shouldn't we? <laughs> it's just it's just nuts, isn't it? Mm. I see it's complete nuts. The world's completely nuts. Yeah, I see we've got um, a professor at uh, Lancaster University is now telling us that terrorist attacks are the price we pay for living in a liberal democracy. The idea of freedom of speech and freedom of access to the internet allows groups like ISIS to radicalise marginalised people with material accessible online, says Dr Simon Maybon. Lecturer at international in international relations at Lancaster University in the UK. Oh, obviously, I'd imagine he's getting paid very well to um, to follow the party line there, don't you? But you see, well, you see, that's just that's just bollocks anyway. Isn't it? It's just absolute utter bollocks. You see, he's what all he's doing is repeating the very same thing that academics of the time were writing about when the postal service came into 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 play. They were writing about how it allowed pornography and and and, and things that um, that that may we may not you know a good God fearing man wouldn't want to see. It allows people to send those to each other. It's the same thing. It's just an update. That's all it is. It, we, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to blame something that in itself is an inanimate object, the internet itself, it's inanimate, but we, it, it, it becomes animate when we plug our computers into it. We're trying to blame that for our behaviour. I mean, what, what, what sort of society does that? We're blaming something else for our own... That, it's an externalisation of power. It's not my fault, it's the internet. That, that pornography was far too uh, graphic for me, and, and, and so I had to... Go out and commit a sexual act, I, a crime. I, it, it's just nuts. It's again, it's the victim society. It's not my fault. I did it because of this. We need to take control of our own lives. We need to t we need to take responsibility for our own lives and not and stop trying to blame every man and his dog for everything. Mm -hmm. 
I do know is uh, just seen a report here that the the killers of the French priest were chanting in Arabic. Killers chanting in Arabic fr- film priest priests throat slitting. Details about the French church attack. I would think they're making sure they make that one as obvious as possible for anyone who's not got the actual backstory there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, I did see that um, there's uh, accusations flying about. I don't know uh, how true they are at this stage that uh, the former head of NATO has uh, played a big part in the Turkish coup. Did you see that at all? Jason, I, I did see I did see a brief headline. I didn't read the article on it, but I did think as soon as um, I saw it, I did think of um, Paul, a financial mm-hmm. dude. Because um, yeah. that, that 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 was pretty much that's pretty much his take, and uh, pretty much my take as well. I, I I think after I'd looked at everything and spoken to certain people, so it, it's yeah, it it doesn't it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me, but again, the whole thing's just so messed up that you just don't know what, who's doing what and saying what and who's planting what and who's creating what. We've got to remember this is a media, even independent media, it's a media that, that can be infiltrated and, and people do, 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 you bet your ass there's independent radio shows like just like this that have been set up simply to you know to to put disinformation out to mm. to derail people who are, who are looking for for different things that are looking for things that we well that is a problem um when you kind of your eyes are opened a little bit to to what's going on in the world you, you suddenly think, right, well, I've been listening to the BBC and ITV and Fox and, and, and all that for all these years, and I thought that was true. So that's not true. That must mean that anything any alternative radio station puts out on the internet, it's got to be true. And you can go down so many blind alleys and um, you can listen to so many people. I won't name anybody, but... Um, shouty, ranty, fear-mongering types. Uh, I think you know what I mean there. And oh, yeah, Alex Jones. I've got no problem saying that. Mm. I've got no no problem. I, I mean, it's just... I don't, I don't know what happened to Alex Jones. I don't know whether it were um, a really good operation that were uh, started well um, and kept below the waves and now is showing its true colours. Um, or... It's. I, I just really don't know. I don't know whether. I mean, for, to go for Trump is is just ridiculous. Yeah. You know, th- this is somebody who's been campaigning for Ron Paul for for years and years and years, and 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 to go for Trump is completely the opposite of Ron Paul. It's a, a three sixty. No, it's a one eighty. The three sixty would be back at Ron Paul, wouldn't it? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's complete one eighty. It's it it just doesn't don't seem to don't seem to resonate with me. And um, that uh, Watson kid that's from Sheffield, uh, what's his name? Uh, Paul Watson. He's oh, Paul Joseph Watson. Watson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's from, well, he's from Sheffield. Mm-hmm. Um, he's uh, he's just I don't I don't even but I didn't really get on with him anyway but um he seems to have turned into a right uh, a bit a bit right wing in fact completely right wing in fact i'm expecting him to come out with a, like a kkk hood on one day <laughs> i am half expecting that you know and just say look these guys are misunderstood mm. i'm wearing this with pride it, you know it, it's just gone it's just gone so far it's just crazy and so it, it's not just um, mainstream media that you have to be wary of. It's alternative as well. It's not all... Well, I've, not just, all... I've just looked on breaking news, actually, and uh, sure enough, we've got another shooting happened just, just before we went on air. Um, 
Man wounded in shooting at Malmo shopping centre. An unidentified shooter wounded a man at a shopping centre in the southern Swedish city of Malmo on Tuesday. Police reported, according to Reuters, the condition of the victim who was shot in the leg and taken to hospital remains unknown. It's messy in there, but one man has been shot. Probably in the leg. He has been taken to hospital, local newspaper something in Swedish quoted police officer Lotta Svensson as saying the perpetrator and his motive were not immediately ex- established according to police Ooh, I wonder if the perpetrator shot himself because they usually do don't they yeah yeah after leaving the uh, ID behind and uh, a tip I think they leave a tip as well don't they for you know for anyone who's cleaning up <laughs> yeah, you, know, you get these crime scene cleaners, don't you? I think they, I think well, now what they do is they, they, they leave the passport. Well, two forms of ID, so it would be a passport and a driver's license. There'd be a video in the pocket that's um, where they're pledging their allegiance to so-called IS. <laughs> that's a, I pledge allegiance to so-called IS. <laughs> I, you know, it's just is it the and then. And then they, oh, I blow myself up, bang. It's just stupid. It, what can you do? What mm. can you do? I mean, you, you, what can you do? I say to people, right, you know when I see one of these and, and somebody will say something and I'll go, oh, but can't you see that? It's just, that's just nonsense. It's just utter bollocks. And, and they'll go, they'll look at me like, I, you know, like, like I've just, Pissed on the chips. Yeah. You know. What can you do? The, 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 it, 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 we've got. Well, I'm all right anyway. Mm. <laughs> well, we, we have actually got a correction in the chat room from Keno. Well done, Ken. He's been checking with his Oxford Dictionary, which comes as standard with a Mac, apparently. And one can confirm that the interwats it is not inanimate fact. It's in the Oxford Dictionary, so it must be a fact. So there you go, stand corrected, Jason. Well, well I would be corrected if it were right, but I'm not corrected <laughs> because it's not right. I mean, the the interwats it itself is inanimate. If it has nothing to animate it, as a like such as a um, a computer, then it's nothing. Hmm. It's just sat there. So it is inanimate in itself. But so uh, I just asked Ken just to, just perhaps you know, just calm himself down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we give it life essentially, don't we? But um, yeah. So anything else you've been noticing in the news you think worthy of comment, Jason? Um. Uh, well, I, I, do you know? I, I just get a little bit sick at news. It's just. It's just crap. Oh, I mean, what do we? Uh, come on, what we had? Um, has there been a? There, there were that um, thing in. There were another nightclub shooting, weren't there? Oh yeah, it was a teen night. Yes, it um, was a teen night, and and yeah, it were like one o'clock in the morning or something, weren't it? What's twelve year olds doing out at one o'clock in the morning? I mean, I know it's Miami, but for God's sake, is it not a school night? What's the mum and dad's doing? I bet the mums and dads are at bingo. That's what it is. This is what happens. In Florida, you've got the mums and dads. They're at bingo. Uh, kids are out all night. They don't know what's going off. And uh, and, and then somebody goes in and decides that they're going to shoot some children. Mm. God, blimey. Bingo really I don't know has got a lot away to with answer. It, I, don't, I don't know why they keep getting away with it. Bingo really has got a lot to answer for that case, hasn't it? It has. It's got a lot to answer for. I see uh, Syria's quite big in the headlines still, and uh, we're getting quite a few details about Gaddafi and uh, Gaddafi's henchmen who stole millions from Libya found laundering money through British banks. So, Well, there's a surprise. It'd be a surprise if he weren't. Keeping us very focused on the Middle East... I uh, found this classy story about Jihadi Jack. He misses donuts and kebabs, but he doesn't miss his parents. That just shows you how evil so-called IS are. Because mm. he doesn't yeah, miss his they, parents. They are the axis of evil. Yeah. 
so-called is. Oh, oh, that's good because he, he's a j- jihadi Jack. Jack Letts told Channel Four News he opposes IS and denied that he's fighting for them. He no, said he, he, how did Channel Four News find him? He said he went to Syria to quote search for truth. For a sandwich. And <laughs> and he has no regrets about his choice. Jack's parents, John Letts and Sally Lane will face a terror trial next year after being charged with sending their son after he was accused of joining IS. He's 20 year old. What's it got to do with his parents? I would have thought. Well, do, do you know, how can he get... Well, it's, how can he be in trouble for his parents sending him for a sandwich? Well, I do. Well, they, come on. They, they, they might, it, he's gone to Syria. Has he yet gone to bleeding to Syria? <sighs> he probably just went to Marmaris on his holidays and got lost. <laughs> yeah, or he went to Londis, right corner, and got lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, Muslim Morris. Uh, I think I'll tell you what to do. Yeah. Put a record on. Okay, now. Yeah. Oh, oh let's, let's have a record. We've we've got a bit of uh, blue oyster cult here, so um, a word of advice for us all: don't fear the reaper. And we'll be back in a few minutes.
Hi, I'm Andrew K. Fletcher, originator of Incline Bed Therapy, talking to you on Raconteur News. And welcome back to Raconteur's News this wonderful Tuesday evening, and I hope you've all enjoyed the content so far. Um, we've had a break, and we've had a quick game of Kaplunk, and well done for winning that one, Jason. I'll get you on the next round now. No problem, uh, and sorry for sticking that like cocktail stick in you. But, you know, you were cheating, and I can't have it. Mm. Yeah, well, it's old habits die hard, mate, but I'll try not to do it again. But, uh, yeah, for those who are not aware, um, Jason and I will be taking a break next week. So I think we'll probably have a pre-recorded show to put out then from uh, Gordon Bowden, Pete Bromfield... David Veach and possibly even Stevie as well from Pandora's Box Investigations Limited and uh, it's been a while since we've had them on the show and um, by all accounts they're up for doing regular updates with us so quite looking forward to that we'll perhaps have them on once a month or so as they've got updates to give us so that should be good shouldn't it Jace? Yeah it should uh, that, that's uh, that's um that that's one show sorted, mm-hmm. but uh, what about another one? I, I, now I thought about how about mm-hmm. um, me and you. We decide we have some sort of competition between us, mm-hmm. and we rerun our favourite show. So I'll pick my favourite show that we've yeah. done so far. You pick yours, right. and then we'll have some sort of competition between us, and then we should rerun um, whoever wins that favourite show. All right. What sort of competition are we going to have then? Well, I thought. Uh, well, I didn't think. I didn't think really. It's just I just made that up. What about I spy with my little eye competition? Yeah, go on. Well, first of all, what about your favourite show? Oh God, there's some to pick from, isn't there? Um, it, it's very difficult to choose for me. Uh, I know the Rick Simpson ones are all up there. Um, I, I, hmm, I think the Andrew Fletcher ones, uh, particularly that one we did with Tony Moran, are right up there. But I thought the one we did on CBD the other week, we had um, uh, Priscilla Una on for about half an hour at the start, and then we kind of nothing to cover, so we got a few. Folks who'd been uh, using the CBD oil and got a few testimonies in there. That's that's up there. But I, I could pick a favourite out of them. Which, which is your favourite then, Jase? Well, I mean, we're having a few... Um, I, I, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting a few uh, suggestions of the competition we should have. Mm. Uh, Ken Up have, has said, have a wank off. I don't know <laughs> what that one of them is. Um, Heath's just texted me about three times saying, uh, biggest knob competition... Uh, and then quicker than a penalty shootout, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but my favourite show, I think my favourite show is the uh, was the uh, Diane Jesse Miller show, the one we had Diane Jesse Miller on. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a, that was great. That. Mm, yeah, I, I think, I think that's my favourite. I suppose for me, Eva Bartlett and um, 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 David Halpin would have to come up there as well. I think they were two blinding shows, weren't they? Yeah, and we and Max Egan as well. We had Max Egan. He were, that were a decent show, but I think I got the impression he were a bit tired at that p- particular point in time. Yes, I, I think he apologised for for being a bit dull because he was jet lagged, didn't he, or something like that. Yeah, he, and yeah, yeah. He got a bit sharp as well, didn't he? And he started calling you names. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Don't you remember? What did he call me? Oh, I can't remember. Something about a hippie or something. But you had your hair cut a week after. So <laughs> I, I don't think it had any effect on you. Oh, I forgot I got long hair, yeah. Yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, we'll have to get Max back on soon. I must send him a message soon and see uh, when he's available. And I know he's he's obviously busy with his own output of Crow House, but we missed the trick with John there, didn't we? we um Jimmy Church getting him on just after he was on with us last time and getting him lined up for a regular weekly slot. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, we had Glenn and Honor as well. He was pretty good. We'd have to get him on very soon. I know he's been ill. Yeah. Um, 
it was anyway around about April time, um, and it, I think all the family were ill, so uh, we have to get him back on. He's just done an update on his um, on his uh, documentary about NWA. Ah, right. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, Fresh think... out of Compton, that, that that film. He'd done a he'd done a um, he's done a um, a critical analysis of straight out of Compton, so um, it should be good. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. I, I think um, Lennon holds the record for saying "motherfucker" the most time in a short space of time. Doesn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, we, I mean, we. Just, I think I, I, if I remember rightly, we were on the old platform, weren't we? And um, the chat room. Somebody had somebody had been <laughs> told off in the chat room for swearing, and it was only a really mild swear word. And then suddenly, straight afterwards, Lennon said "motherfucker." <laughs> yeah, I think about uh, twenty. Uh, 27 times in a row, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. And he also holds the record for... Um, I, I think I asked him a question at about 27 minutes past and then we had to shut him up <laughs> just before we shut up because <laughs> we just couldn't get a word in edgeways. The guy can talk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, look forward to getting Lennon back on. I mean, it, it, there are so many people when we go through the archives, I suppose we ought to be getting some of them back on. And I'm just a little bit wary of you get the same old people doing the same old radio circuit and you could probably listen to all your favourite people by just listening to two or three radio stations because they all seem to do the rounds. I, I like it when we get somebody a little bit different, not on the usual tour, if you like. Yeah, which is why I enjoyed uh, Diane Jesse Miller because she'd not done any um, media for quite a while, mm-hmm. um, and I know that after she did our show, she did a couple of other uh, radio shows after us that, um, on the back of that. Oh, great. and um, she's also got um, she's doing a, a, a film, so she must have got some funding for a film. So yeah, to people like that. I mean, you know, people that you don't normally hear. Uh, Diane Jesse Miller, John Hamer, uh, again a great guest uh, with a hive of information. I mean, the the guy should be. I think everybody should get him on on, on the show. Um, but like you say, there, there does seem to be a, a, a certain like like you say a circuit, and um, it, it's what what will draw people in. I think is what a lot of people do. Um, th- th- that's what that's the reason why. They, they, we get the same people over and over again because they've got a following, and and then they 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 get on. So, but yeah, I think we've we've given some we've had some good interviews with some uh, some people that you don't normally hear at other places, which which I've enjoyed, mm. really enjoyed. In fact, the ones that I've I think the ones I've enjoyed the most are the ones that um, I perhaps I've not really been looking forward to doing sometimes. Yeah, I know what you mean. Sometimes you think, oh, what we're going to talk about here, and it goes off in all kinds of weird tangents, and you think at the end of it, bloody hell, that was good. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, not so much that. It, it's it's like, you know, well, I'm in a bad mood. I've been in a bad mood all day. I've had a bad day at work, or, you know, I'm, I've someone's pissed me off. I've had somebody at the door pissing me off, or phone calls piss me off, and, and then... Um, you come upstairs and then you you get into it and it, it all so it all seems to fall into place. We've had a few of them, a few of them. What about how old are we now? About sixty seven is this? This is show number sixty eight, I think. Yeah, shit, sixty eight. Sixty eight. Oh my god! Another ten years we'll be have to get as uh, as pension. Yeah, we we keep rattling them out. Two a week, they seem mount up. Excuse me. So yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we 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 we'll we'll decide uh, we'll decide on whether we're going to go for Ken's uh, suggestion, um, and we'll decide or Heath's, <laughs> um, or we'll just put one on anyway, <laughs> willy nilly. Yeah, I think that probably sounds like a good bet. Because you'd probably win at both end competitions anyway, mate. So, well, it depends, doesn't it, on, on weather? <laughs> yeah, I suppose we're both going to have the same weather, though, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sounds good enough for me. Mm. 
So, yeah, it's going to be nice to have a bit of a break there, a bit of a break away from all the Skype and emails and Facebook and all that. Are we Are we going to do a challenge for a few days with no communications whatsoever? Yeah, I think that's. I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, a couple of days away, um, no communications whatsoever. But we'll take a camcorder and we'll uh, go and record a bit of stuff and perhaps put it on YouTube channel and put a link in the chat room. Yeah, uh, and we'll we'll what we'll do is we'll smoke some things and uh, then sit and have a chat and film it. Yeah, that worked well for Derek and Clive, didn't it? What could possibly go wrong? Well, exactly. Exactly. Nothing can go possibly wrong at all. <laughs> but we'll have a few beers and uh, take a bit of time out. It's. It, 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 I know I, I. I don't do it half as much as you. Um, but sometimes it does take it out of you, especially when you're working as well. Well, that's it. I mean, you you've got a full time job. Um, I don't, so I'm in a better position to do what I do. Um, if it was the other way round, it'd be different, but. Things are the way they are, and it's it's kind of like um, what John was talking about. Um, that that email he sent out today was talking about excuses, and he, he said that the the way the system works, it just gives everybody loads of excuses. And he said if you could um, turn excuses into a means of generating power. We could close down all the nuclear, coal, oil, and gas power stations in the world straight away, because uh, the world seems to run on excuses. And we, what you were talking about, what, what people, what can people do rather than just saying, "Oh God, it's all screwed up. We can't do anything." He says that you've got this wonderful tool at your disposal, and it's imagination. Unfortunately, most, if not all, of us need to learn how to use that tool again. Oh, absolutely. Um, but but when um, he was saying, uh, you know, that it's all doom and gloom, I wasn't actually saying it was all doom and gloom, but you need to know what you're up against. Mm. So you need to know all this stuff because then you, you, you know you're up against it, what you're up against. There's no point in just burying your head in the sand and not knowing. If you know all this stuff, you can arm yourself then personally. You can know... The tactics, you can know that the way that they attack you psychologically, the way with vaccine, so you can protect yourself. You know that you don't get vaccinated. I don't get a flu jab. You know, I, I'm not having a flu jab. So that's that's partial, me partially protecting myself. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that information, but I didn't use that information and then think, oh, I'm a victim and I have a flu jab anyway, just in case they work. Mm. Uh, and, and you know I don't want to die of flu because I'm scared. That's a victim mentality. What I do is I say I'm not having that flu jab, that, and that's me protecting myself. So you need to know the stuff, and I know a lot of it is quite dark and it can piss people off. And, and but but if you know it, you can protect yourself against it. And and that's that's the way that I see it. You know, if you don't know your enemy, how can you protect yourself against it? If I didn't know that vaccinations were full of shit that were going to cause me loads of shit, then I, I, I may have one, in which case... Mm. Yeah, yeah, the, the imagination is a wonderful tool, and uh, it's something that... It's quite difficult to learn how to use it, isn't it? You know, what do you do? Do you just sit there quietly and wait for ideas to come to you, or do you try and do something to stir your imagination? Or is that what you're trying to stir your imagination with, just to distract you? See that you, that you see that's the thing is what you're doing is you're looking to try to 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 stimulate your imagination when really what you've really got to do is you've got to get rid of all the other shit that's in there. That's in your head. All the other shit, you know, the stresses and the, and that I'm worried about this debt thing and I'm worried about this and there's war and there's terrorism and you get see they pile all that shit in your head. You've got no way. Your imagination's stifled. If you can get that all out of your head and say, look, this is not relevant to me. Most of this isn't relevant to me. Most of it. 
99% is not relevant whatsoever. I get rid of it. Once it's out of your head, there's plenty of room for your imagination to, to, to thrive. But what? But if there's all this other shit in your head, what's your imagination going to do? It's going to be stifled. It's going to be looking for room inside your head. And, and then what you do is you're going through the mess to try and find your imagination when really all you need to do is get rid of all the shit and your imagination will grow on its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's something weird gone wrong with my software because I can't see half of what's going on now, so I, I hope everyone can still hear us. <laughs> hmm, yeah, that's weird. I was just uh, searching for a tune to play us out with and everything's all frozen. So, that's a bit weird. So, if you can still hear us, just let us know in the chat room, please. Yeah, I think someone. I think they can still hear us. Someone just got rid of a load of shit the last couple of days. I had the shits, literally. <laughs> so I think that's what we were just talking about. Shits, weren't it? Having shits. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of shit. Yeah, Ken says, oh. unfortunately, he can still hear us. <laughs> oh, and Joan, Thanks, can hear, Joan can hear us as well. Thanks for that, Ken. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Tony as well. Tony can hear us, so it looks like we're still going. How we? Well, it looks like we're going to have to talk for a few minutes longer because I can't get a tune to play out on. But oh yeah, I can. I can find one. Find one another way, can't I? Do, do, do. Well, how nice. about you? Tell us your best joke. Tell us your favourite joke. Uh, that'd be a rude one. No, don't matter. Oh, no, no. As long as it's not too rude. <laughs> yeah, it is too rude. Well, and that's your favourite joke? Yeah. One too rude to tell? Yeah. Outrageous. I had a mate years ago I worked in car sales with, and I used to bump into him every few years. Never saw him in between. And every time I saw him, it was always in a pub. And every time I saw him, he always asked me to tell the same joke again because <laughs> he loved it that much. So, so that what you've done now is you've not actually told us the joke. No. You've told us an anecdote about telling the joke that you're not going to tell us about how good the joke is. Yeah. And now you've now the joke's been built up to such a, a crescendo that no matter what you do, you can't. You're never going to be able to do it justice, particularly on radio on AM. Are we on AM? No. <laughs> I'm going out to the south of Spain. No, no we're not. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we'll not bother with Ken's jokes either. Mm -hmm. What's? <laughs> yeah, I think no, that one would get. <laughs> we'll not bother with that one, shall we not? No. <clears throat> uh, all right, then here's my here's my favourite joke ever. Okay, this is my favourite joke ever. There's a bloke, and he's got his dog, and he's he's an act to turn. Right? Yeah. And he is Darren and his amazing talking Dalmatian. Right. Damien. Oh, God. So it's Darren and Damien. Yeah. So Darren's the man and Damien's the amazing talking Dalmatian. Uh -huh. And Darren turns to Damien and he says, Damien? What's it like sitting on sandpaper? And Damien says, Roof. And Darren says, Don't you mean rough? And Damien says, What do you fucking ask me for then? <laughs> oh, well, I've actually got a suggestion for, for a joke, and uh, it's from a good friend of ours over in Canada. And it's quite a short one. He says, two Canadians went hunting. They were following some tracks. Got run over by a train. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd like to say uh, thanks, Jason. It's been fun tonight. And a big thank you to John Rappaport. Um, always a great guest. Look forward to getting him back. I'm looking forward to talking to Chuck O'Celli on Thursday night. Um, unfortunately, I'll be doing it on my own because you won't be able... Well, I don't know, Tony might be joining it. Depends how busy Tony is. 
but uh, if not I'm sure I can while away a couple of hours with Chuck um, and we'll be as ever warming up for Dr Rock so look forward to that Thursday night's always a great night on RN and uh, we're going to play you out with a tune because my software's decided to start working again so uh, we'll play you out with something that seems rather appropriate imagination just an illusion do you reckon that's all right jace sound as a pound right now i've got to pack all these games up Anna. yeah yeah you pack, pack all these games up and and do you know what i know you've got them tweezers off operation so you best give them back before you know before i go no you can search me i ain't got them mate all right Okay. Take care. So, we'll see you in a bit. So yeah, enjoy your holidays, Jason, and uh, we'll, we'll you'll be back on the air on the ninth, won't you? If you insist. Yeah, apparently. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. As always, without you, we'd be just talking to ourselves. And I'll be back on Thursday night with Chuck O'Shelley. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>